online, it, it helps us um, justify doing our online programs. They only take about one or two minutes. So we thank you for filling that out. All right, Paul, uh, Paul Winsky will pre be presenting and, and we're ready for you, Paul. Okay, thank you very much, Brandy, for that introduction. And uh, just a quick note for Brandy and Julie and Susan, just keep an eye on the lobby because uh, sometimes we have some people coming in a little bit late so you can admit them. So uh, since I'm getting started here, I will focus on that presentation. So uh, here we go. Um, so I'm going to give you an update on some of the trialing that we've been doing. And this is right now that it, it's focused on ornamental plants. Um, predominantly annuals, some perennials. There's a couple shrubs in there. Uh, and just give you an idea of, of, of some of the work that we're doing uh, and, and how that information, this, this is allowing us a, a good opportunity to get that information uh, out to the public. Um, first off, I, none of this information, none of these trials would have happened without the help of the Harris County Master Gardeners. So uh, a big thank you. This group, um, I'm not listing names because I know I would forget somebody, but um, these trials are encompassing things that we did at Bear Creek while we were still there. And also now what's going on down at uh, Precinct 2, the Genoa Friendship Garden. So without this team, um, none of this work would have gotten done. Uh, they make my job easier. Uh, they're a, gr a great group of uh, folks to work with. And, um, you know, I, I, I truly appreciate everything uh, that they do in order to help these trials and demonstrations uh, to occur. So why do we trial? All right. So there's two things we want to evaluate. We want to evaluate the genetics. All right. We want to evaluate the plants. Uh, and in bedding plants, as you can see here, here's a, a row of lantana. We're looking for uh, flower production. We're looking for uniformity. We're looking for disease resistance, pest resistance. We're looking for drought tolerance. So you can see in this line here, these guys aren't looking so good. Um, but this line here, you know, that's what we want to see. We And, and when we talk about series, okay, uh, that you'll see uh, in most series, you're going to have multiple colors within that series. So one of the things that we look for and that I look for is uniformity within a color. So say there's a, uh, a red and a yellow Snapdragon and they're both in the Snaptastic series. Uh, I want to make sure that not only within the reds and the yellows, they're uniform, but for that whole series, whether it's red, yellow, white, pink, um, they should all look uniform also across the colors. Uh, and that is a key, especially for if you're a landscaper, even a homeowner, you're going to want the nice uniformity uh, in your beds. Uh, and you want to make sure that if I'm buying Snaptastic Red or Snaptastic Yellow, that they're going to work well together. I don't want one being 12 feet, uh, 12 inches tall and the other one only being four inches. Uh, the uniformity and height should be there. And then the other key is our environment. All right, we growing here in Texas is difficult. Gardening can be difficult. Uh, we can go from extremes with our heat. We can have drought. We can have rains. We can have hur hurricanes. You name it. We've even every now and then I've been here 20 years. We had a couple snowfalls. So, um, you know, we want to see how that environment influences the genetics of these plants. Uh, so we can be, be able to find uh, what the best ones are. We can give those recommendations not only to the homeowner and they're going to be successful, but we want to I, I we need to let that information out or let the growers know these are varieties that perform well. And then the landscapers know that these are are, are varieties that, that that perform well. So this is how this the, the the goal of this is to make sure that genetics will work in our environment and everyone's going to be successful. So the, the first one I, I wanted to talk about, and uh, this is one we did several years back. You can see this is still at Bear Creek, but I, I felt it was uh, timely because, you know, our cool season is going to get here, hopefully soon. Um, and we did this tulip trial uh, several years back, but it, it's very, it, tulips are very easy 
to grow down here. Um, if as long as you're purchasing pre-cooled tulips and most of the tulips that would come in or if you ordered them online, um, they will come in pre-cooled, which means they basically um, they've been cooled. They've been tricked to thinking they've been vernalized and they're ready to go. So the and it's a pretty easy crop to grow. So you can have this wow factor uh, basically within a 10 week period. Uh, and here was the schedule that we used. We, they were planted on week three, which would be the third week of January. So the bulbs came in um, pre-cooled about week six. So three weeks later, we started to see soil break. So the shoots were starting to break through. We saw our first bloom color in week nine. So that was six weeks later. We had peak, peak uh, flowering at about peak color about uh, week 11. And then by week 13, they were done. Um, it's a quick crop. It's a quick turnaround. Um, these bulbs will not perennialize because of the, our temperatures. So it's a one shot deal. Uh, so you've got to weigh the uh, question or the idea of uh, does it make sense? You know, is the price right to get the wow of these tulips uh, in order to um, uh, you know, uh, get the wow factor. Uh, so go ahead and you, you've got to consider that in, in going forward with trying these, but they, it was very easy to do. Um, we, we, we dug a, uh, circular hole. I think it was about four inches deep. The bulbs went in, filled in noses up, covered over, watered them in, and that was it. Uh, and you can see the progression. So some of the varieties that we looked at, uh, World Peace was one, so this one uh, topped out uh, probably right about two feet, a little bit taller than that. Really nice color, really good uniformity. Uh, so these these bulbs were uh, performing e extremely well. Um, very good germination and emergence. Then we had World Favorite. So uh, this was a, a variation of uh, the first one that we looked at. Uh, again, very good uniformity you can see there within that um, and these colors really pop they they performed extremely well for us uh, as we were uh, uh, evaluating these plants uh, passional was a shorter one you can see the foliage was a little bit different uh, sort of had a wavy foliage to it um, and the color was was really intense with that uh, dark purple uh, color to it this variety was much shorter, um, just slightly under a foot, um, but very good uniformity again uh, with this variety. And then we had Van Eck, uh, which uh, had a sort of a coral color, uh, was sort of in between the Passionel and the uh, the World uh, series that we had there. But again, you could see uh, they all came in at the same time. Um, they all bloomed, you know, within that same window. Uh, and it was a very quick turnaround, but it gave you that feeling, especially if you're a, uh, a transplant from, uh, you know, the, the Midwest or the Northeast where you, you would plant normally, we would plant our bulbs, you know, September, October, let them overwinter, and then they come up in the spring by purchasing the pre-cooled bulbs. Uh, you plant them after the first of the year, and by the end of March, um, you've got to enjoy uh, the show uh, with these flowers. Ono Vandenbreck, it was a sort of a, a buttercream yellow variety, um, about a uh, little over uh, a foot tall, uh, about 16 to 17 inches. And so as the uh, flower matured, we would get these uh, pink blushes uh, on the outside of the petal. So uh, it was a really nice uh, contrast that it would provide uh, to that plant. All right, so then we also done, we've done some earth kind trials. We've done earth kind roses, and I want to touch on this uh, shrub trial that we did because it was really uh, rather interesting. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, the hurricanes, uh, the floods, we weren't able to finish it, but the information that we got within the first two years of it was really uh, quite helpful to us. 
So with this trial, what we wanted to do was identify those plants um, that would have strong landscape performance, um, but they don't it, uh, require, um, there's no pesticides, we don't fertilize, and there's only limited supplemental irrigation. Okay, and I talked about, you know, earth kind practices in one of the other uh, presentations. So I wanted you to see how this uh, lent itself uh, to this uh, trial. So here it is. Um, we looked at several different species, and these were just one, one plant, one variety of each. So this bed uh, on the right side, uh, the, it was amended with uh, three inches of compost. Um, and then you can see the drip irrigation. So um, plants were planted, they were spaced out properly, drip irrigation was in, uh, and then all we did was covered with a three inch layer of mulch. And this was right out of the back of the um, tree service. Um, this was rough cut, non-composted rough mulch. Uh, and so you can see how nice and clean uh, that looks um, once it is uh, in and established. And this is what it looked like uh, during that first growing season. So the first year, that spring, we watered on a regular basis to get the plants established. In the second year, water was cut off uh, and only applied as needed. And we'll, we'll take a look at that. But you could see uh, we had Himalaya, Tacoma, there's Budleyas here. Um, we had some hydrangeas along the backside. So we had a, a, a hodgepodge of different varieties. Uh, these plants were donated from different by different nurseries uh, to allow us to see how they would perform under the earth kind uh, practices. Now here's some of the data from 2015. So uh, back in April of that, that year, um, we took uh, the plant area, uh, the height by the width, uh, to give us what the overall, uh, what we were starting with. And then in November, uh, we did the same thing. Now you could see we did lose one, so purple pixie um, died off on us. Uh, and then here's the, uh, the change and then the percent change. So uh, in all but one case, it was positive. We saw positive growth. Um, and like I said, there's no fertilizer, no spraying. Um, it was just that initial compost add mulched, uh, and then very little water. And we'll see that here in this next slide. So in 2015, we had 70 inches of rain that year. Um, you can see as we come through February, you know, May, we were pretty good. The only month that we had to irrigate those plants was in July, and it was for two days, July 17th and July 29th. And each of those uh, ran for a cycle of 40 minutes. And then that was it. There was no other water applied to that, to that trial, to those plants for that entire year. So by incorporating this earth kind trial, these earth kind practices, you can really minimize um, the amount of water, you limit pesticide, you li limit fungicide, all of that pretty much goes away and i'm sure if we had gotten another year out of that we probably depending on what the uh, uh, overall rainfall for uh, 2016 would have been uh, i bet you we i felt that we probably would not have had to water or irrigate any supplemental water in that year because that root system would have been so well developed uh, the mulch would have helped maintain that moisture uh, and those root systems would have been uh, able to cope with whatever uh, we had to deal with. So the earth kind practices work extremely well. Um, and it, this just is a, a brief picture of, of how well it does work. Okay, so I talked about the Master Gardeners and Genoa Friendship Gardens. Um, they are located in Precinct 2. There's the address, 1202 Genoa Red Bluff Road. Uh, they are open on Mondays and Wednesday mornings, all right? And so I would say about, this is probably our third year um, with the trial gardens, with the flower gardens there. Uh, we had the orchard, we had the vegetable beds and things like that. 
Um, but now uh, we put these bed, beds in. Basically, we lost Bear Creek. We needed a, a place to go. They had some space and they said, you know, um, let's go for it. So the team there, uh, we, we laid it out and uh, lo and behold, uh, we were able to get uh, five beds in there. And um, so what we're going to look at now is some of the highlights of those trials. Uh, we'll get a good idea of, of, of some of the plants that we're working with and um, uh, the ones that performed very well. Uh, one of the ones that uh, performed well for us is this salvia. Uh, this is summer jewel. This is white. It's an all-American selection. Uh, in the landscape, it topped out at about 15 to 20 inches. The unique thing about this one is uh, it is just a nonstop bloomer through the heat of the summer. So if you're looking for color to bring in uh, the beneficials and, um, you know, the pollinators and things like that, um, you might want to consider um, growing this series or, or asking your garden center if they have a grower that will produ that's producing uh, the Summer Jewel series. The other, so you can see, we talk about uniformity. Look at the, the height on that and the uniformity across. Look at the flower production on it. Um, the number of blooms that are open and uh, the foliage is very clean and healthy, which is always a plus. So the other great thing about this is this is one of the few series um, that every color in this mix. So you've got white is shown here, but there's lavender, there's pink and there's red. They're all all American selection winners. So when we talk about uniform, not only within the color, but across the series, um, you know, this this is a, uh, a a blue ribbon winner, really uh, interesting that they were all these colors are, are very uniform. They're very clean, very good flower production, and they perform uh, very well across the. Um, across the uh, series. OK. Uh, another one uh, now ornamental peppers. This is about the time of year that we're going to start seeing ornamental peppers on the market um, and they they provide great fall color. All right, so this is New Mex Easter. This is again another all American selection winner. It has very compact growth. So this is a, a series that you're going to want to grow um, probably in the in the front of the bed. But what I like about this ornamental pepper is how those peppers are held above the foliage. You can't miss them. You know, they look like uh, little Christmas lights. And so um, that color pops. The other thing that's great about it is uh, as they open or as the fruit starts to mature, it's one color. And then uh, as it ages over time, the colors change. So you get this kaleidoscope of color uh, over the entire bed, over the entire collection um, as the uh, plants grow and mature. Another ornamental pepper um, that performed extremely well and is also another All-American selection winner is this onyx red. Uh, so here we've got really bold, dark foliage. Uh, so even before the uh, it sets flower and sets fruit, um, we've got some something interesting to look at uh, in the landscape. Uh, and then what happens is as it flowers, it sets fruit. It's the, the fruits, you know, they look like little marbles. Uh, and you can see that when they first per, uh, develop, they're sort of green. Uh, and then you can see some black ones in here, they get black, and then as they mature, they turn red. Uh, so again, a really nice contrast. Now the, the fruits aren't held up as high on this plant as say what we saw with the New Mex Easter, but um, the, the contrast and, and the, the boldness of the, the color against that dark foliage, you can't miss them. Uh, so again, I, this is another great plant for this time of year. We're getting close to Halloween. And um, it is uh, it, it just catches your attention and will uh, will wow you uh, definitely from a distance. Now this Vinca, this is Mega Bloom Orchid Halo. Again, we're we're talking about uh, we're a, a a test garden or demonstration garden for All American Selection. So they send us seed every year of of their winners, and this is one that I, I was really happy with. Um, 
the the size of the flower was great. Um, that white eye and the contrast against the orchid halo um, was was you know quite stunning. Um, look at the flower production uh, over the entire plant in this first image, um, and the uniformity uh, as you go down the row. Um, this plant also had very good disease resistance, which I was, uh, you know, I was surprised. I was skeptical. I'm, I'm a big Cora fan uh, for Vincas, um, but this plant did extremely well. This whole series uh, did very well. Um, we didn't see the aerial Phytophthora. We didn't see it, you know, once the humidity and the heat uh, kicked in that we didn't see it um, sort of crash on us and melt. Um, so um, the Mega Bloom, uh, there's other colors in there. There's about 16 colors total. Um, and then they have another series called Mega Flow, which is a cascading series. So uh, if you want to use it in uh, hanging baskets, uh, combination planters, uh, or even if you have a, a raised bed that say uh, that has a stone wall, uh, the cascading form will will go ahead and 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 cascade over top. So it gives you a nice um, look um, with the with the same type of uh, flower production. Um, now we, we're talking about a canna. Now this canna is grown from seed. A lot of the cannas in the industry are done by division or tissue culture, but this is a seed uh, series, um, and this is South Pacific Orange. Um, and and I was really impressed. In the past, there had been some seed varieties out, but their germination was very hit or miss. Um, with this variety, um, we had very good germ germination and really good uh, overall growth. Now you can see there's some damage in there, and that's, that was probably the only negative we saw in this plant in this, uh, in this initial growing season. Um, but the flower production was great, the color was good, and the uniformity was good. So we kept um, one uh, section of this or a few plants of this in one of the beds, um, and it has perennialized for us just like we would expect, but it hasn't gotten taller. So the genetics are there that this is a, you know, what I would consider a, a midsize or, or dwarf twipe type of uh, canna because, you know, some cannas can get as tall as six, seven feet. Uh, but this maintains that, you know, consistent 28 to 36 inch um, height in the landscape. So it's a very good, uh, I, I like it, especially if you uh, have a small space. You know, you can even grow this in a container uh, and it's gonna look good. It's gonna give you something, uh, that tropical feel, but also an upright uh, vertical look. Now this dianthus, this is a jolt and it's an interspecific hybrid. So what do we mean by that? An interspecific hybrid, um, it's two different species. So dianthus is the name. Uh, there's the, uh, and there's different species out there. So this one has dianthus barbatus in it. And Barb if you remember Sweet Williams, um, that is dianthus barbatus. And Sweet William has a nice fragrance. So this has some barbatus in it, and it's got something else. I don't know. Uh, the breeding company knows. But the uh, great thing about this is this plant. Most dianthus will only bloom say in the cooler uh seasons for us once the heat comes dianthus aren't real happy they'll still stick around uh, but they won't you know be over excited about what's going on uh so what happens is is you know they'll, they'll, they'll go out of flower and then when it cools off uh that you might get another flush this one blooms throughout the entire season uh in the heat of the summer uh august this had flowers on it. Um, maybe not as heavy of production as what we're seeing here, but it had flowers on it. And those stems were very, are very, very sturdy, which is nice because um, if you want cut flowers, if you want to enjoy them inside the house, uh, you could cut them, put them in a vase and enjoy them there. Um, this is pink uh, on the uh, jolt, but there's also a cherry. So it's a darker uh, reddish color. Um, but the jolts are one that I would recommend to keep an eye out uh, for. So 
this gives you an idea. This is some of the data. This, this is an, a, a compilation of the data from from this trial. So um, you could see the mega blooms, uh, how well they scored. So um, what we look at is here is the week it was planted. So week 21 is probably mid-May and week 23, 25, we're in June already. And then we grow these through the summer. And then the team, um, we usually have two people, two two person teams, they go out every two weeks and they score and they look for uniformity. They look for flower production uh, and and it's sc uh, scored on a scale of one to five. We've now switched to, to one to ten, um, but it's, it's scored on one through five. So three would be average. You know, we sort of start at three and then what makes it you know, what makes it tick up above a three or what are we seeing that maybe it drops below a three that we, you know, might have some reservations with that plant. So you could see in general, um, these plants scored extremely well. Uh, and the only, you know, knock on that South Pacific was it did have some insect damage to it. Uh, so it, 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 it was knocked down a, uh, a little bit, but overall, um, all of these plants that are listed here, I would feel, you know, confident in recommending them uh, to anybody because we know that they performed uh, extremely well in this in, in this trial. So this is the, the the type of data and what we're looking at uh, in order to come up with these scores for these plants. Some other highlights. Now we're we're talking about a perennial here. This is Phlox. It's a fashionably early crystal, uh, and it's a very early bloomer. Uh, this is this was the first year, but it has overwintered. It's come back. It's blooming for us. Uh, the thing I like about this, and I've been highly impressed, was is that I'm not seeing um, powdery mildew on this. Um, other varieties, when when I've trialed them in in previous years and at previous jobs, we've always run into uh, various issues with powdery mildew on these. Uh, and this one doesn't. I, I have not seen it. Uh, the foliage always looks healthy. Uh, the flower production is good. This is early spring uh, and it starts blooming quite early. So um, if you're looking for a phlox and you want to mix in some perennials into your bed, uh, fashionably early crystal uh, is one I would recommend. Now we've got, um, if you like petunias and petunias do well in the cold, cool season, uh, here's another All-American selection winner, and this is Tidal Wave Red Velour. Uh, and you can see the growth on this. Now, the Waves, you know, the Wave series uh, was the first to come out, and then what they did was they um, expanded that line uh, as it went on. Uh, so we have Tidal Waves, we have Shock Waves, we have Easy Waves. Uh, the Tidal Waves are the largest of the group. So they can get as tall as 24 inches. And you can see uh, in this lower uh, image, you know, how tall those plants are getting. Uh, and the spread on those plants are probably going to get at least three to four feet wide. So uh, if you have to cover a large area, you know, these tidal waves for the cool season perform extremely well. Um, you can see the flower production on it. It's over the entire plant, which is great. Uh, I remember when the the first uh, plants of these came out and then when they bloomed, it looked like a donut. They only bloomed around uh, the edge or the perimeter perimeter of the plant. The middle was all green. So you could see how the breeders over time have uh, improved it. So it's blooming over the entire plant. So red velour uh, is a great um, plant. I would say it's an early season up until about April-ish, May, depending on how hot we get, how early. Um, and then it just, it, 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 it gets a little rough and it's time to switch out uh, to your uh, summer color plants. Coleus was a, uh, a lot of fun when we looked at it. Uh, we did them in, in shade, we did them in full sun. Uh, this was in the uh, sun area. Uh, there's four varieties here. Uh, th this dark purple one, almost like Merlot, was Vino. This is electric lime. Then we have Coleosaurus, and then we have redhead. And uh, Coleus has really come a long way. Uh, there's a lot of excitement 
um, with coleus because you can do a lot of things with it. You can uh, use it in a bedding plant situation like this. You can use it in combination planters. You can just grow it in a container by itself as a standalone because of the size and the color that there is now. The other thing that we're seeing with a lot of the coleus now is um, they aren't setting flower, which is nice, especially, you know, if you don't mind deadheading and going and pinching out the flowers, because the flowers are really pretty insignificant on coleus, you're, you're growing it for that foliage. Um, so if you're a landscaper and you've got large beds and you're maintaining, uh, if you don't have to spend time getting in there and pinching out the flower spikes, that's great because uh, lower maintenance, lower handling, you can be doing things uh, that are more important. Um, and it, it just makes life a lot easier. So uh, these plants, there's a lot of very good colors out there and there's always new varieties that are coming out. So um, keep an eye on coleus in general, but these four were one, of, you know, were some of the four that, that just those colors just really popped. And I think, you know, for this time of year, you could see a combination of just these four, you know, in a large planter would, would be quite eye-catching. So, um, there's a lot of interesting things going on uh, with coleus. All right, uh, another perennial, uh, and this one is really uh, in early spring. This one just really pops. Um, if you were driving by at 50 miles an hour, uh, you would notice the color and contrast with this plant. This is a sedum. It's called lemon coral, and in the lower picture, you can see um, this is a uh, uh, second year growth, so you can see how it fills in this bed rather nicely. It looks like a, you know, chartreuse carpet. Um, and here's enough close so you can see the texture. But look how it works. This is uh, this past cool season. So these are uh, violas uh, and these are snapdragons. So just look at the contrast of that color. So, you know, when you're working with some of these lower ground, these ground covers and some of these colors and that are perennial, you know, they, they, they offer a lot of color options. They offer texture uh, and it allows you to do a lot of great things. And really, this, I, I love this picture because, um, you know, I work with the team on what, what plants we're bringing in, but then it is up to them. They do all the design work. And so, you know, my hat goes off to the master gardeners with regard to the design work out there because they just make the colors work. Um, they pop. This is a um, crepe myrtle, a lagostromia that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. But at that dark foliage, even the dark foliage on that crepe myrtle, you know, pops underneath that uh, uh, sea of uh, coral, uh, lemon coral. So uh, they just do a, an, an excellent job with the layout on these trials. Um, this is something that we've got out there now. This is a Celosia and it's uh, part of the Soul series and this is Gecko Green. And uh, this one, it, it, it does set flower, but we're really growing this one more for the foliage. Uh, it's almost like something to uh, maybe a, a complement or something that you could grow for its foliage as opposed to in, instead of growing uh, coleus. Um, so it adds an interesting color, uh, an interesting texture uh, it, in the landscape. It's about 14 inches, I would say. Um, but it's, it's really interesting how the new growth has more green in it, maybe a, a, a burgundy edge. And then as it matures, uh, the foliage just gets darker and darker. Uh, so uh, depending on the time of day, how the light hits it or how old that plant is, uh, it's going to look different. Uh, so it's a, uh, a, a really interesting plant. So this is one that will probably be on the market next year. Um, uh, it, it's a, it's a, a new variety. We got some trial seeds. So I would look at this if this something if this is something that catches your eye. Uh, you know, this gecko green, uh, the Soul series, uh, might be something uh, you might want to give it a try. And then there's another one. So this one's called lizard leaf. So look in these two images. One is, you know, full sun right on and that burgundy foliage just, you know, lights up. And then when you see it uh, where there's some shading, it, it, it has takes on a whole new uh, look. 
which is which is really interesting. Uh, so it's got that burgundy maroon foliage. Again, these are in full sun. Uh, so you can see these plants are holding up in the heat, uh, performing extremely well. And I would say they're they're in that on our end, um, they're probably closer to 16 to 18 inches as they mature out. Um, they are starting to set some flower. So I am starting to see some flower. And I think that's because we're starting to go into shorter days uh, and we're starting to see that flower production occur. But I've been really uh, surprised at how well these plants are doing. I wasn't sure of a celosia grown for its foliage, how well it was going to perform. Here's that Lagostromi I talked about. This is cherry mocha. It's part of the Barista co collection. Uh, it's got burgundy foliage. Now it's not as dark and rich as say some of the, you know, the black diamonds and things like that. But the th great thing about this is it's dense compact habit. This plant has been in the ground for two years and if it's three feet, that's that's probably about it and it's not going to get much wider so if you've got a patio home and you want a uh, crepe myrtle you like the flowers um, this is a series or one that you might want to consider um, the flower production is nice it's held above the foliage it's, it's got a great contrast to it and there are other colors in this series there's eight different colors in this series um, it's all in that barista collection they've got some really creative names with it um, but this is one, again, for t smaller areas, even in a large container, um, this would be look nice on a, an entryway or a patio uh, if you want to have that crepe myrtle look. The Zinnia Zesty was one that we looked at last year. It was a new series that came out and is available now. Um, these are full double flowers. Uh, and you can look at the flower power on these. You know, this is a little bit taller, so it's not like the uh, the shorter ones. Um, you can see they had to stake them a little bit just to keep them upright. It's one that you could cut as a cut flower if you needed it. Um, it topped out anywhere in that 18 to 24 inch range. Uh, and the colors were really vibrant. Uh, I think we had all the colors. We had fuchsia, we had pink, scarlet, and the white. And the white I really liked because, you know, whites are usually hit or miss, but the contrast of the, the, the flower against that healthy dark green foliage uh, really did set it off. Uh, so if you're looking for to try a different zinnia, again, great plant for the heat of the summer, brings in the pollinators, beneficial insects. Uh, the zesties are a series that you might want to consider. Now, on the, another perennial here, this is Nipophia, Red Hot Pokers, common name, uh, and this is part of the Pyromania collection, all right? So some great marketing names here. Uh, landscape height, probably about three feet. Now, the flower spikes will get taller, but when we talk about the, you know, that foliage that gives you that grass-like foliage, uh, it's probably about two and a half to three feet. Um, Nifophia are deer and rabbit resistant. So depending on where you are, if you have any issues with that, this is a plant you might want to consider. It is a perennial uh, native to South Africa, um, but the flower production on this is, is just incredible. So here's Flashpoint. So it, it sort of has that chartreuse look, and then uh, as they mature, they turn yellow, and then they turn to white. And then here's Backdraft, where the lower flowers are uh, we'll have a yellow color, and then we've got orange. So um, they did an excellent name naming this uh, series and this collection. And I've been really uh, happy uh, how they make it through the heat of the summer. They 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 keep going. Uh, you'll get sporadic flowering throughout the summer, uh, but again, in the, in the spring and and early summer, we get very good flower production. So it's a, a great perennial to consider in the landscape. Um, this past year for the cool season, we looked at uh, a lot of violas in the Penny series. This is Penny Blue. Um, really good flower power. And this is one of those uh, plants that you either, um, you know, the, the question is, do you do violas? Do you do pansies? Pansies have larger flowers, maybe not as many. Violas are smaller flower, but very good flower production. Uh, as you can see in this series, there's over 30, there's roughly 37 colors and mixes. 
Uh, and so the seed companies do a nice job where um, they'll have the, the winter mix or they'll have the beacons field mix and it'll be a combination of three or four colors. So you don't have to buy the individual colors. You can just buy um, that mix and you get the, uh, uh, the, the, color, uh, the colors that you need. Um, they, they work extremely well. Violas, I would say, they're going to be in the front of the bed since they are low growers. They're not very tall. Um, I know they will start to hit the market here soon. Uh, I, I think planting them in October, November is much better, um, you know, because because of how long our heat sticks around. But then once they are in the ground through March, maybe early April, um, you'll have flowers on them. So uh, violas are, are, you know, I can't say enough of positives about them. Um, and they, they just perform extremely well. And I do like this uh, penny series. All right, so that gets us uh, to the end. Um, I am, uh, let's see, let me take a look at the questions, if there's any in here. Uh, any mealybugs on the salvia, Larry asked. I, uh, we did not see any, um, and uh, I, it, it was pretty clean. Um, no major issues with it. Uh, ornamental peppers, yes, Cheryl, full sun, absolutely, uh, because that color on those peppers will come out even better. It, it, the contrast will do much better. Uh, how do this re bees respond to zinnias? Um, I've got some at the house now. I see them working them every now and then. Um, I see a lot of bumblebees on them more than, you know, than the honeybees. I, I guess I've got more um, bumblebees in my area, um, but um, I, I see them working them on a, uh, on a regular basis. Uh, can we pinch the blooms on the celosia to maintain the foliage production? Um, Carolyn, go for it. Give it a shot. Carolyn is one of our master gardeners. In fact, I pinched uh, the one at my house to see uh, how it would perform. And so I'm waiting to see. I, I just did it recently. But we've got enough of plants out there. Uh, you can pinch the tops out uh, just to see uh, if we trick it to uh, continue to uh, uh, produce that foliage and not go into a uh, flowering state. Okay. Um, what plants from GFG grow well in the shade? Uh, Wendy, that's where we're at there, uh, and, and um, I'm sure you're aware, um, that is a full sun area. So we're, we're not at this point looking at shaded plants, but the violas will do well in the shade. Uh, I guess you can put it this way. Most annuals, they'll do okay in the shade. Um, they'll survive, they'll grow well, um, but you're probably not going to get the flower power on them as if uh, if they were growing in full sun. And that's one of the biggest challenges. So you'll get some flower production on them, but it's not going to be the same as if, say, it was getting, um, you know, if it could get morning sun or afternoon sun, at, at least a, a, a decent amount. If, if we're talking deep shade, will it bloom? Yes, but you're not going to get the flower production uh, that you would expect. Uh, so that's why maybe trying uh, some of the coleus or things like that that you can grow in the shade, um, you'll get that color pop uh, and you won't have to worry about uh, diminished flower production because you're not growing it, growing it for the flowers. Okay, uh, let's see. I am, I don't think I'm seeing anything else. Okay, so great. So, um, what I would like to do is thank you all for joining us. Um, I hope you enjoy this. Uh, you will be receiving an email uh, with the survey. Uh, we do appreciate you taking the time to complete that. Uh, the, we like hearing from you to get your feedback. Uh, and tune in for next week where um, Brandy is going to be talking about Cool Kid Plant Projects. So uh, from Texas A&M AgriLife Extension here in Harris County, I want to thank you all and uh, everybody, you guys have a great day.